we have a very long history together, so we get to kiss each other. It's all wonderful. Gosh, we have way back before Orphan X. How many years has it been? Probably 25. And I, <laughs> you did. I think you were here for everything but your first two books, if I recall. We yeah, I came with Do No Harm. Right. So a and very then you published a book called Do No Harm, which you sent for me to blurb. It was a very good book. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Love it. Anyway, I am so pleased that we get to continue seeing Orphan X here at the store. And um, I have to say that, and Greg knows this, and some of you probably heard me say this before, but Patrick, are we live? Oh, good. Hi, virtual audience. Hi. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I'll start over again. When we had our little store over on Main Street um, back in the, in the 90s, and people actually still read books on airplanes, we would find cars would shriek to a halt in front of the store, and they'd dash in, and people would say, quick, sell me an airplane book. So we sold them the Charm School by Nelson DeMille because it was an absolutely perfect thriller for an airplane. So when Orphan X came out, I said to our staff, Charm School's dated, I said, but now we have Orphan X, so it is now our airplane book. We don't see too many people screeching to a halt on Goldwater <laughs> in front of the store, but it still um, is that kind of a wonderful page-turning thriller, great character. So why don't we go back for a moment, Greg, and talk about where, where did Orphan X come from? Because you wrote, you wrote books of various kinds, you know, for a long time. <laughs> I wrote a lot of kind of Hitchcock standalone thrillers, which was really fun. And I had this notion for Orphan X in the back of my head, and I was I was afraid to write it. I kept shoving it to the back burner, and I wrote another book and then another book because I kind of thought for me to write something that I hoped might have a chance of being in that pantheon with Reacher and Born, I wanted to really make sure it was distinctive in every way where I thought about you know, what differentiates an Orphan X action scene? Every aspect has to be different. It can't just be something that could be a born scene. It could be a gray man scene. It had to be something that was totally distinct. And so I took a lot of years just sort of waiting and thinking about it. But I have a lot of friends in the spec ops community, and we talked a lot about different black ops that they'd done. And I kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be great if there was a program that just took kids out of foster homes, um, kids who wouldn't be missed if they were to vanish, and trained them up independent of everybody else, completely in a silo, and sent them off to do the U.S.'s bidding, where the U.S. was not allowed to go to execute murders that are in, illegal under international law. And if they're ever caught, they could be tortured to death or rot in a prison, and they don't actually know anything else, right? They're the ultimate cutout man. And I'd say the, the first real big turn that I had about what would differentiate this notion, because that's a, that's a story that others have played with, David Morrell has played with that beautifully, was I thought, well, what if him being taken out of this foster home, he's from an East Baltimore foster home, on the one hand is this horrific training that he's led to, but what if his handler, and turns out to be his father figure, Jack Johns, what if this also turns out to be the best thing that's ever happened to him in his life, and Jack actually loves this kid? And so one of the things that Jack tells him early on is the hard part is not going to be making you a killer. The hard part is keeping you human. And the series in a lot of ways is a sort of it's a it's a series about his becoming about his trying to become a human. And one of the things I've, I've reflected on a lot as I look back on it is that if Jack had turned him into a true believer, if he was just the ice in his veins assassin, um, it would have been a lot easier for him. It's easier to be a true believer. It's easier to think in black and white yeah. and to. Uh, you know, join up with the home team. Um, but the other thing is that I realized is I started this series at a very unusual point. So he abides by the Assassin's Ten Commandments. Um, you know, the most famous or is probably the second one. How you do anything is how you do everything, which people have gotten in like tattoos and on jewelry. Um, but it's very interesting because I didn't start Orphan X where I logically would, which would be him in a foster home as this kid or him doing his training with Jack or him as Orphan X committing these murders on, you know, six continents. He's left bodies um, on six different continents or when he leaves the program because his moral compass is at odds with it and he becomes the nowhere man where people can reach him. They can call the number one eight five five to nowhere, which you can all call and you can see who answers. Um, and 
I didn't start the story with any of those things, even his Nowhere Man missions. Where I started the story was the first Nowhere Man mission that all 10 of his Assassin's Commandments go out the window. He has to break all 10 of them. And so it, it begins at the point in a way how I think of it is he almost has this realization that he's this archetypal character who's been raised in this way. Um, but it's almost like the series begins when he realizes he's Pinocchio, but he wants to be a real boy. And the series is the process of him trying to figure out what it means to live in the real world, to have any version of relationships or community, and to learn to speak what he was never taught, which is the strange language of intimacy. So um, he does range all around, but he does have a base, right? And you've gone to a lot of trouble to construct his home base. Yeah, his home base is a penthouse on the Wilshire Corridor. He lives among ordinary people. He hides in plain sight. He's got this penthouse. It's, it's pretty cool. He has a, he's a floating bed that's a metal slab that's propelled by magnets. So he's sort of floating above, you know, he's off the ground three feet. Everything, he has OCD, this meticulous meticulous, diligent assassin. When he operates, his rules are just very, very clear. Um, and so it's all poured concrete and stainless steel surfaces. And it's very much contrasted with the apartment of, there's a single woman uh, who lives downstairs, not a single woman, I'm sorry, a single mother, uh, Mia Hall, who lives downstairs. And she's a district attorney. And she's a mother to an eight-year-old boy. And they have this kind of undeniable chemistry. But if she ever really knew who he was, she'd have to arrest him. But every time when he goes down to her apartment, there's like crayon mashed in the floor and there's throw pillows and candles and sights and scents and colors. And it's all that sort of warmth and mess of human interaction, which he's spent his whole life insulated from in a way. Uh, but his base of operations is pretty cool. If he goes in his shower and grips the hot water lever, it keys to the vein pattern in his hand and it clicks open and opens into a secret vault where he's got it's sort of his base of operations. It's his nerve center. Right. It's an armory. It's computers. It even has, I'm not sure, is it an actual talking plant or is it a plant that he talks to? Um, Vera. Vera. We're now on Vera 3. The, yeah. One of the jokes of the series is he's so incompetent at contending with human life that the only thing that he has, he has two things. He has a living wall. I don't know if you've ever seen those. It's a, it's a vertical garden that's drip fed. And so he uses that sometimes to, to clip off mint or something if he's cooking. But he has this one plant, and it's an aloe vera plant. And the only care he needs to, to show it is to put a single ice cube on top of it to water her once a week. And he can't even manage to do that. So we're now on Vera 3 because the first two have died. Um, and she doesn't actually talk, Barbara. Um, but she, you know, he, he, he projects on her. Yeah, she's, Vera's had a tough run. That's true. <laughs> True. Now she's in the, you'll be happy to know there's a Vera in this new book. Um, <laughs> right. So it seems to me that the, you know, the existential problem you have in this book is that if you have a real loner, if, if he is that kind of a character <clears throat> and everyone around him would be in danger if they knew who he was, like Superman going into the phone booth to change so nobody will kill Lois Lane, um, as you're writing a series, how do you keep other people from attaching to him or caring about him? You know, and so you remember Barry Eisler's first book, of which one of us could forget, Rain Man, and you know, and he w it was perfect that way. I mean, Rain Man was entirely solitary in Tokyo, um, and but it didn't it didn't last because as soon as he got attached to anybody the original impulse kind of went away. So how have you balanced that? Because there, there are other people in um, Evan's yeah. life now. Well, and part of what the series is, when it begins, amusingly, he's much more of a lone wolf, though the title in this case uh, attaches to a female assassin who's sort of his dark mirror opposite in this way. And she's the most deadly assassin he's been up against, probably since he was up against Candy McClure, who was Orphan V, who pursued right. him in the early books. Um, but... The book is a lot about the tension between perfection and intimacy, which we don't think of as opposites. But perfection, in a lot of ways, you can have your schedule, you can have your routine, you can have your absolute determined discipline, and other people don't care about that or mind that very much, right? When you have other people in your life, people are messy, people are complicated, people screw up your schedule and your life and your 
timing and hold up a dark mirror that show you flaws in yourself. And I think one of the things that we love the most about stories and about fiction is watching characters in relation to each other, is watching how they engage, is watching the tension between them. And so the notion of him as a lone wolf was not part of the process of him becoming a human, of him wanting to turn from Pinocchio into a real boy or an archetypal character into somebody who could see other people in their full humanity and then have to break these rigid commandments in order because he was he was feeling and seeing them in a three-dimensional way. But part of that means letting other people into his life as reluctantly as he wants to. And so, you know, the clearest example is Josephine Morales. I have a character called Joey. When he met her, she's a 16-year-old hacker. She's a washout from the orphan program, and she's the last thing he wants to have anything to do with. And in the course of Hellbent, that's the third book, um, she slowly grows on him. They're kind of thrown together in this mission where he's stuck with her, but she's trying to escape from him. And they have to sort of execute this deadly gauntlet together. And in the end, I was planning to kill her. I was still writing from, uh, I say that so casually. Um, <laughs> But you can see in Hellbent the moment where she's supposed to die at the very end. And I got all the way there and I couldn't kill her. Um, I just, there were so many facets that she brought out in Evan and I'd grown so attached to her. And it was so funny to be writing this 16 year old Hispanic girl like this. I mean, in real time, she was, had such a distinctive voice. She was so much more clever than I was in a lot of ways. And so she was, the, she was sort of a key part of this. He has another friend, Tommy Stojak, who's an armorer. But, you know, last book or two books ago in Dark Horse, uh, there's another character I introduced, Aragon Oria, um, who becomes Orphan X's first friend that we see him make. And I thought, well, what would, what would somebody be like who would be Orphan X's friend? I'll tell you, very powerful and very deadly. That's to start. And Evan nearly kills him when they first meet. And so it has been a process of starting to, in, to ensconce him in a community where we're seeing all these different sides of him and they're all challenging him to reflect upon himself and all the ways that he is courageous and squared away and operationally perfect. He also observes in seeing other people who are more, have more depth of emotion, his own lack of courage in certain things. And so even the characters who live around him around, you know, he's in this penthouse, this residential tower and off the Wilshire corridor in Los Angeles who are sort of, initially he's viewing them, we're viewing them as caricatures. There's the elderly Jewish woman who lives downstairs who's always aggravated with him. There's the very uh, officious HOA, the imperious HOA director who's always screaming about, you know, regulations. And as the books progress, he starts to see these hints of vulnerability in them or um, hints of fragility or hints of their hopes or longings or pain. and he starts to break through his shell of understanding around them in a way. And so everyone sort of starts to become more real around him as he starts to become more real, as he starts to thaw into this notion of what it might mean to live among people as a human being among people, rather than merely as a wolf who hunts wolves. That's really brilliantly said. My question was far shallower uh, because <laughs> what I was worried about was the safety of the people who were attached to him because if, in fact, they are in his life, does that paint a target on them? Well, and that's happened a lot with Mia Hall. Right. That's a big part of it because she's got a boy. And so they're on again, off again, intense chemistry. And there's different times where she's also needed him separate from his endeavors that perhaps might land her or Peter in trouble, mm -hmm. but where she's gotten in a kind of trouble that the law can't answer because she's a vehement, you know, she's an, she's an officer of the court. She's a, right. a highly ethical DA. But there's times when her boy is is at risk that some of those ethics go out the window as pertains to Evan. But that is a big part of it, and that's his biggest fear. So there is a, this is not a spoiler for the plot, but there's a very nice scene where Evan is able to engineer the HOA picky guy and the elderly lady. Um, and it's really a very nice scene. So good for you. I went, I thought I thought that was that was really nice. Mid all the action, politics abound at the HOA at Castle Heights. No, well, you know there are HOA specialist attorneys all over the place, and I read um, I have one that's verging on the dysfunctional at the moment, and the Washington never fear, <laughs> but the Washington Post actually ran an article about what can people who belong to an HOA actually do? Because usually it's one person. 
that makes an HOA difficult. It's not generally all the people, but you know, the thing, it, it's just so classic. A small amount of power can really turn people into. I recommend just sending in an assassin. Well, <laughs> listen, if he were real, he would, I would be calling his number. But, <laughs> but anyway, the Washington Post ran an article, and it turns out that the foremost HOA attorney in the United States is here. He is in, I think, Mesa. And um, so I have his number. I'm gonna, I can call his number. That I do know, should I actually need him. Um, but, you know, I, I laughed when I read that part of this book where, you know, there's a, a brouhaha in the HOA. And I thought, you know, that's, that, that can actually happen to you if you it reminds me belong of the, to one. There's a joke about academics that I love, which applies to HOAs. And the joke is, why are academic squabbles so fierce? Because the stakes are so, so low. low. Right. <laughs> and so the HOA, you know, he'll come in with his, you know, wrist slashed open with death threats from a cartel right. member and he'll be sitting in the meeting and they'll be having this irate discussion about the the density of the carpet pile for the new <laughs> lobby. Or, the, you know, should they have kombucha in the lobby? And so he's constantly subjected to this. And so right. that's one of the other things that's, that's really fun for me because we don't see James Bond go home, right? We don't see Jason Bourne get stuck having to make small talk by the mail slots. No, that's very true. Um, well, um, I could go on about HOAs, but I won't. Um, I won't. Um, but anyway, so the, the um, character in the book who is initially at risk is actually not a person. It's a puppy. <laughs> it's a dog that is at risk when this book opens. So if you're going to obey the un, I'm not, no spoilers here, but you know, an absolute law in writing crime fiction is that everyone can die except the dog, right? The or a cat. dog must Those survive. Cat well, the cat too, but <laughs> yep, right. You know, maybe a goat could be sacrificed. I hadn't really thought about that. You know, probably horses generally survive. But anyway, there is that is the call that he gets to start off this story. Well, so the story, this is, it starts off in some ways, it's the smallest and most personal opening, which is Evan is standing, he's out in the middle of, of, of nowhere in Texas, uh, the end of a dirt road, and there's a, there's a dilapidated trailer and the man who might be his biological father is there. And he's never met him. He was an orphan. He never knew his parents. And the book opens with him walking up and knocking on the door. And we just hear footsteps approaching. And I cut away. And the next time we find him, he's a mess. And we don't know what happened. And Joey goes to find him. And he's drank for the first time to excess. He drinks the world's finest vodkas, which has worked out very well for me. Because if I write about a vodka, then the company's sales go up. And so they send me vodka all the time. We have, <laughs> I get vodka like you get books at the store. Um, the UPS man must yeah. love you. <laughs> and so he's sort of this, this mess. And we don't know what. And he's not saying what happened. And, and we haven't determined it. And so Tommy Stojak and Joey are talking to him. And they say, look, you're, just get back on your feet. You just have to do something small. And the Rome zone, his encrypted phone rings. And it's a little girl. And her dog is missing. And so with great indignation, he takes on the case. And he's, he's bemoaning it, saying this is the stupidest mission ever. It's Orphan X in the case of the missing dog. It's like an Encyclopedia Brown story. <laughs> Um, and sure enough, and also the dog is like the ugliest, shittiest dog you've ever seen. It's this <laughs> quivering, it's got a carbuncle on its nose. The dog is based actually, so I have, you, you might not be surprised to know that I have Rhodesian Ridgebacks. A Ridgeback features prominently in the books. And Ridgebacks, to my mind, are the most elegant animals. I feel like we have exotic African, you know, great cats in the house. I mean, they preen and they pose and they're all muscle and... They look like they're waiting for someone to come along and, and paint their oil portrait. <laughs> and I had for a brief time, my, my adult godson lived with us with his two dogs, and there were these yappy, scraggly, street dog mutts. And one of them was completely infuriating, snaggle teeth, giant bulging carbuncle on its nose, like a chihuahua. And so I also thought that to add to the indignation of him having to pursue a, a missing dog, it's also this dog. And the dog's name is Loco, <laughs> to make matters worse. And so as he embarks on this, um, one of the things that happens is he's, he's pursuing this case and he stumbles into something that, that, that trips off the most uh, prolonged suspense sequence I've ever written in my career. I've, there's 50 pages of 
it escalates and escalates and escalates. It, it's sort of that template of swallow the spider to catch the fly. And he just finds himself fleeing in something that, that culminates in an enormous manhunt across, you know, half of downtown Los Angeles that started from this tiny seed of an opening. And so what starts as the smallest and the most personal in some ways explodes into the biggest mission yet. I mean, this is a man who assassinated a president. Now he's looking for a dog. You know, I mean, you do, I think, you know, but that's that's what makes it work, or the contrast. You can't have the same book every time. And you do need um, you do need ups and downs and ebbs and flows and all to make a series really interesting. Can't always be the same thing. Yeah, I think I so. I say that having, you know, I'm going to exempt Reacher from that because, you know, that's a template that we're all kind of used to. Any watching season two? When he took his shirt off, were you attracted or repelled? <laughs> Never mind. You don't have to answer. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I almost thought I was watching a Marvel comic or something. W when were you attracted <laughs> or repelled, I think, is the question. Uh, I was not attracted. Okay. Right. I thought it was overdone. Let's put it that way. Okay. But but he's an, you know, an interesting guy. And um, I think the casting, up digressing as I always do, I think the casting of the other characters in The Reachers has been brilliant. You know, so I really, um, I, you know, I knew that we couldn't keep the Southern police officer and the black cop from Boston from the first one because that's not how Reacher works. But I, I wondered if, you know, the TV people would decide to override and then, no. Well, yeah, he's more, he's more like Reacher, but right. Yes, he's taller <laughs> for sure. Way bigger, right. But anyway, I mean, Reacher can be. You know, it's not a template. That's not fair. But, you well, know, he does something quite brilliant. brilliant. And he'll yeah, say absolutely. he's got this notion of of the archetype of the story and what Reacher right. needs to do in every single book. And uh, he's he's brilliant at it. Um, mm -hmm. Lee actually gave me fantastic advice when I was sitting down um, when I was editing Orphan X. Did I he? saw him for for dinner in New York and he was talking about, you know, taking time and turning over cards. I just come out of a, a run of nine I think nine straight standalones. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, my, and my first draft of Orphan X had a lot of pieces I used later on in the books. I had scenes from the foster home that don't show up till Prodigal Son. That's the sixth one. I had his first assassination as the Nowhere Man. I had one of his executions that opens book four um, that, that takes place in Eastern Europe somewhere. And I was talking to Lee about it, and, he, and, and some of the advice that he gave that was quite masterful was saying, you know, in a series, take your time with the mystery, right? And a lot of my editing of Orphan X was I was I was sort of, I don't want to say overwriting, but I was expansively writing it. And I wound up cutting probably 30, 40, 50,000 words that went into later parts of the series, but I had to write them to know the character. And so I had a lot of that, which was pretty great because there's stuff that makes me look far more clever than I am, where people go, how did you you know, drop this handkerchief in book two that, you know, comes to fruition in, in book seven. But I had a lot of this that was going on in my head, but really taking my time. And so as much as the Reachers, I think, do have, you know, a sort of archetypal shape to them, there is sort of slow development that you start to learn with it. But th these books are very different in that the, st the style of book and who Evan is and what he's engaging with are drastically different. I mean, if you pick up... Lone Wolf is very, very far from The Nowhere Man, for instance, the second book. The books really change in their constitution, and who he is is changing in ways that are that are quite tangible. You know, what's so great about this conversation is realizing that you are so engaged, you're not bored at all, because if you were bored, we would start being bored, right? Because the books would become boring, mm -hmm. but obviously you're not. <laughs> And part of that, well, thank you. I mean, I, I do say that a lot, that if I'm bored writing it, you're going to be bored reading it. And part of that for me is having this this evolution take place where I always need one point when I'm writing a, a the rough draft where I'm scared that it won't work. I always have to be sort of reaching into terrain that I don't know if I can fully pull it off. And the expansion of him and the kind of issues that he's grappling with and how they expand and where this book winds up and the things that what you know winds up, you know, he winds up in a kind of pitched battle between two like technocrats. I mean, it goes in a sort of insane space with tentacles that reach into all of our lives. But putting him up against these things and having a mirror of his internal conflicts and challenges and how those are pushed through the plot 
for me, it, I'm more, I'm having more fun writing these. I'm having more fun writing now than I have in my whole career. And I, I can't believe that for book 24. I mean, that's, yeah, it's a real blessing. Um, I'm, I can't wait. I mean, I can't, I can't wait to be here to talk about the next one that I'm working on too. Hey, that yeah. should be great. I might mention that there's some chance that Greg will be back on May 6th with Mark Sullivan who um, has got a new book, and we're we're going to iron that out. But I think it would be wonderful to see Greg twice in one year. Hooray. Um, anyway, um, it's not all about the dog. You'll be happy to know that there is, a, you know, another dynamic actually driving the book. And I found it fascinating because uh, AI is something that we've all been made aware of, you know, in the media and other things. And... You have a lot of discussion, well, a lot of action, but also some real discussion about AI. Yeah, I started I started working on this book years ago. Um, I tend to write, I mean, books, as you know, I think you know, come out a, a ways after you've you know, after you've written them. But I also I'm ahead of schedule a bit, and I've been I was really digging into AI early on and talking. One of my one of my friends is a, a staggering computer chip designer, maybe the greatest that there's been he's designed the fastest one three times i was having very intense conversations with him around ai and the role it's going to play and what i really wanted to do in this is as the story sort of explodes into this um world of immense power and influence is to is to show and to portray in realistic fashion a scenario under which ai actually could take over and start to run things while not resorting to it being Skynet from Terminator to really show the process by which this could reasonably start to happen where, you know, to use the template, when I talk about AI, I like to say, to use a Fantasia metaphor, we want to be Sorcerer Mickey. We don't want to be the eyeless mops hauling the buckets of water. It's all about where we are in relation to what the tools are. And there's a way that if we don't have them in their right place, that the tools can start to run and make decisions that they're, in fact, running us instead of us running them. And so this is sort of what expands. And I've been fascinated by the role of um, ethics and technology. I played around with this a lot in the sixth book, Prodigal Son, um, you know, where one of the subplots of that are, are it deals with drone operators. And one of the things I was fascinated to find is that guys who go to work, let's say you're in Vegas and they drive to work and, and a lot of times they're in a container, like a big container, like from a container ship, and they are flying drones and killing people overseas remotely. Um, and then they'll be leaving and driving home and their wife can call and say, can you pick up a, you know, a quart of milk? And they pick up milk and they go home. They have the same rates of PTSD as soldiers in the field. And that was fascinating for me. And so one of the things the army started to develop was to say, oh, well, what we need to do then is to remove humans from the, dis from the decision-making process to kill people. Let's come up with an algorithmic conscience, a digital conscience that's constituted from ones and zeros. And my conclusion in Evans was that's exactly the wrong answer. Um, there's a line that Donald Rumsfeld has in the documentary, The Fog of War, where he says, when you see war get this profitable, you're going to see more of it. And one of the other things that I that I was thinking about was if you if you make war utterly seamless and without pain, we're going to see more of it. And in some ways, the trauma that soldiers bear and the pain that parents have whose children die and the hardship and the PTSD are one of the only checks that we have to to keep acquainting ourselves with the horrors of the world and of, of what war is and what constitutes war. And this is something that Evan's dealing with, you know, in his own life. He was trained to do all of this. And so that collision of, of technologies coming up against the sort of powerful stoic individual is really interesting to me. And there's a whole host of things in this where he's up against and contemplating this as the nowhere man, as somebody who is as the individual standing up in the face of an enormous system and trying to hold and keep his moral center. And that's that to me in a lot of ways is is the most compelling part of of the stories when I'm writing them. Plus, you also have to write about the masters of the universe who actually are doing something with AI, and that I think is one of the most interesting parts of the book. Thank you. You're welcome. So. It's the same concept of machines doing thinking. 
It's like autocorrect, you know. I mean, if you write something enough. Um, yeah, Google, Google searches are AI. Yeah, well, you know? I mean. And you'll notice increasingly, you know, if you're having a conversation with somebody and your phone's on and near you, you start to get sales recommendations for it. And so there's, a, there's, there's it's everywhere. If you just look at one other site, it's suddenly, I mean, in the middle of the Washington Post, I'll suddenly get an ad for my shoes, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's like. <laughs> And Bar Whatever. Barbara's going to go home now and get inundated with images of enormous shirtless men now after this conversation. That's a really happy thought. <laughs> Let, let's skip dinner so I can cut right to it. No, I love that. You um, no, I mean, you know, unfortunately, there's not much we can really tell you about the book beyond this because we're going to start giving you spoilers. Um, so I think that we should take questions from the audience. I'd be happy to. Right. So, right. Well, you call because it's your. Right. Yes, ma'am. So, did you when you when you created Evan? Did you know you were this was going to be a series? Okay, when I created Evan, did I know it was going to be a series? Yes, that's why I was so trepidatious about beginning it because I thought I better. And stories pour into this a lot of different ways. Uh, two two quick examples. One of the things I love with writing these Hitchcock standalones is the question of motive is up for grabs, right? You know why Harry Bosch takes a case, right, or why James Bond does. But what was so interesting when I was playing with the, the standalones was a motive could be curiosity. A motive could be envy. It's You don't know how stories arrive into the, you know, and obviously Michael Conley, they're masterful at, at figuring that out. But for the most part, if you're writing a story, you know the mechanism by which the story arrives. What would be most obvious with Orphan X is that phone rings and that's the case and every book is one mission. But there's also his past that can get to him. There's also the people he's surrounded with. And so once I'd created a character with enough places that the stories can kind of pour in from all sides, I realized that there was a sort of freedom. And I could also identify him. He's not the biggest guy like Reacher. He's not the suavest guy like Bond. I describe him in every book. I say, um, average size, average build, just a normal guy, not too handsome. Um, and, you know, in a lot of ways, I based him on me. I'm, I'm very average in build. I, my wife is, is very diminutive. Um, she's like my pocket wife. Um, she's a little over five feet tall and she's got little tiny feet. I, I don't quite know how they hold her vertical that she doesn't just like fall over all the time. Um, but so any time we go, you know, she has to figure out where to get clothes that were, I'm like anything off a rack fits me. My shoes are average size. Everything about me is like down the middle. I thought it'd be really interesting to have this character who's designed to just blend in everywhere. But I do remember when I sold the series, I called my agent and I said, look, you know, this phone's ringing and there's all these different things. His past can come up. Stories can come in from people who live in the building with him. I said, one day his phone could ring and he could answer it and say, do you need my help? And someone could say, Evan, you know, it's your mother. And I remember my agent was like, that's fantastic. I can't wait for that. Well, that was the sixth book in the series. It just took me a long time to get there. So I was sort of boiling over with ideas about how to build this world and this universe out. So I want to say one more thing. I, I uh, did not know it was a series when I heard my first one. And so mm -hmm. then I just was kind of reading. And you do a great job of every book gives you enough information about him so that it's Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I do try to set up each book that it's its own jumping on point, you know, and then what I like to do is I get all the way through the book, which I hope is, is a self-sustained and, and, and sufficient and I hope satisfying story. And then I like to turn over one card that's a cliffhanger at the end. And what I will promise you is the cliffhanger at the end of Lone Wolf that presages what's to come is the, is the biggest one yet by a long shot. So... It really is. I had to go back twice and look it up to make sure I was reading it correctly. Yes, sir. Sir, just a minute, please. Oh. There are oh. other people who would like oh. to ask questions. That's all right. We'll come to you in one, one second. Yes. I just had a compliment as well. The way that you have developed Evan over time, his empathy and his compassion as he's grown, that's what draws me into this Orphan X series. I love the excitement that you bring to him in his life, but what keeps me reading is his development as a character, as he articulated earlier, and I just, I just love it. Oh, thank you so much. That's very She's kind. She's new to the store, I want you to know. Oh, yeah? So. No, uh, no. But you're, you know, you're I, actually making a customer I right here, that. so thank I you. I love that. Well, it's a good store to be in. Um, you know, one of the things I think about is if we don't have character, we don't have anything. We've all been in those movies that's the nonstop third act where you're just getting punched in the face with action and you don't care. 
And it's so important to have character baked through into everything. And I think about, you know, if you stop someone on the street and you say, what's your favorite James Bond action sequence, they'll stop for a minute. And but we all know how he takes his martini. We all know those those character notes. And at the end of the day, that's what we go to. We go to spend time with those people. So there was yes. yes. I wanted to piggyback off of that. The other thing that I think sets Evan apart is the sense of humor. And I wanted to ask oh, if yes. it was based on you, but I can just see from your banter with Barbara <laughs> that you have a quick wit. And that's the other thing, not only his character development, but he doesn't take himself too seriously and the humor is just wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. This is the most lovely set of questions I've ever had. Isn't this great? <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. I rehearsed yes. them before you came in. So first of all, thank you so much for not showing my story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the banter between her and Evan. It just, it just makes me laugh. Thank you. Okay. She's very happy with me, too. <laughs> Books are always like children. It's like they all have their own problems. You know, they all have I have such different affection for for them in different ways. They all do different things. And one of the things is as much as each one stands alone, I'm trying to do something which I didn't fully realize I was doing when I started the series, which is have each one stand alone. I have new readers each each time in and then they go back and they're always okay to do so. But I'm also trying to build them all into and I will say after the 10th book nothing's going to be the same again and so there is also an overarching arc that is happening at the same time and they all have their place in that and they all have their own importance to me in that so uh, yes yeah, more news soon. I hate to be coy, but I can't. Yeah, there's some progress being made now. And I think, you know, it's like I don't love announcing development because development's development. But I think there's some things shaping up on the on the Hollywood front that, that we might have some concrete news soon. Wonderful. All right. Um, yes, sir. Um, one of the things. times where it almost brought me to tears, the oh. ending of Hellbent being one of those. Um, and do you ever find as you're writing these passages um, that it affects you emotionally as you create them? Yeah, I, I, it's, I spend more waking hours in the books, right, than out of them. And so I'm very affected with them emotionally. You know, some of them are heavier than others where it's hard to get my head out, especially if I'm going first person into an antagonist. It might be an antagonist that I'm not particularly fond of, but I'm trying to really embody to have them be a steel man and not a straw man, let's say. And some of the emotional scenes, you know, I got quite emotional writing um, Trayvon in um, the the autistic man, uh, or, you know, he's on the spectrum. I don't really specify where and how in Prodigal Son. There were some really emotional scenes with that for me. Uh, and some of the Evans yielding into a kind of begrudging intimacy with Joey. Those scenes are really tender also. So, yeah, it can be quite emotional. It's a bit of a family thing, too, with Greg, because his um, some of his relatives are medical professionals and so forth. And so it is a bit of a family thing, isn't it? Mm. Some of the earlier books in particular were, yeah. but I know that you always thank members of your family and yeah. the afterwards and so forth. Did you have a question, sir? Yeah. How, how did you develop that? I'm sure. <laughs> I, it just occurred to me that, you know, part one of the things he does is he, he's not big on bluster, right? He's not big. You, he doesn't look like much. I, actually, I'll tell you, I just connected. I just connected that. It's so weird that we do these things forever. And then all of a sudden there's there's this sort of conscious connection. I'm friends with a good number of Navy SEALs. And some of them, like one of my best friends is a giant, he's a big galomp, right? He's a former 60 gunner. He's huge. His, like his arms don't taper at his wrist. They just turn into fingers. He just looks like a brute. <laughs> Nobody would in their right mind would mess with him. But other guys, I have one friend who looks like if you put 
Tom Cruise in a dryer and shrunk him down from there and he runs like super marathons where at altitude where you run a marathon a day at high altitude for a week i had another buddy who was a who's a sniper kind of long hair looked like a surfer dude and when they were out in different locations in different zones he'd just go into a town into like a village somewhere with a backpack and act like he was a lost you know uh student uh backpacker well there's one time we're out in la and we're doing some drinking, and there's a bunch of big outlaw bikers in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> These stories are so great. And things start to get out of everyone's kind of joking, and then the guy was kind of pushing and pushing him. And my friend just looked at him. And there's just this look he had in his eyes that if you looked at it, you just would not ever mess with him. There's just something else that's in his eyes, and you can see it. And you can see the minute that it gets there. And this huge kind of biker guy sort of backed off and everything was fine. Like it just wasn't going to escalate. And he's no bigger than I am. Another guy was a hundred pounds of muscle bigger than he was. And I've always just thought about what that thing is that you have in you, that somebody can look into you and know that you, you have whatever it is that is not going to be bothered by anything that you do. And that if you're going to start this, you better be prepared to finish it. And so that was, that's what went into it. And so there, you know, the line that repeats is he says, I want, you know, he usually describes what they're doing, right? You got your big blocky boots and your swagger and your big voice. I want you to look at me, look at me closely and ask yourself, do I look scared? And then I've had fun playing with that. So there's, you know, once I've established a lot of the conventions of Orphan X, it's also fun to put them on their head and make fun of them. You know, as he answers the phone and says, do you need my help? There's a scene in one of the early books where, you know, he's making his bed, which, of course, is the magnetic floating bed. And he's got his combat boots on, his original SWAT boots. They're not combat boots, but they're, you know, tactical boots. And they have a steel shank. And one of them gets sucked into the, <laughs> the, the kind of um, magnetic field. And he, he's like falls on his back and can't do anything. So then he goes down with one sock and one shoe to get a, you know, there's a certain kind of crowbar that doesn't throw sparks if you're using it for demolition breaching from his truck. He's in the elevator. Everyone's looking at, you know, Peter's on the elevator looking. Who's this, this guy with one sock on? He goes back up. And part of how he got into this was that the sheets wrinkled slightly, right? So he keeps trying to get the wrinkles out of the sheets because it's driving him crazy with his OCD. And he goes back, and the second boot goes under. <laughs> and he slams on his back, and the room zone rings. And he just answers on his back and says, do you need my help? <laughs> And so I've had a great deal of fun establishing the conventions and then starting to take them apart and to also make fun of them. And then Joey makes fun of them also. One, one, one quick question. So would, would Jack have found perhaps a future parachute and come alive in a future scene? <laughs> oh, you're so hopeful. <laughs> Jack's already had, he's already come back a time or two, yeah, you know? Yeah. 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 Like you went out of the airplane, and that's all we saw. Yeah. Well, there are flashbacks available. Patrick, you must have a couple of questions from the online audience because you're yeah, standing over there. Yeah, I do. Um, let's see. One of them is um, kind of re related to what somebody else had asked. Do you draw upon your own fears or phobias when you're working on these books at all? Yeah, of course I draw my own fears and phobias. I mean, there's, it's so funny. Whenever I go to a movie and it says, based upon real events, I always think, how could it not be? <laughs> like, what, how, do you, how do we have something that's not based on real events? Um, so, yeah, everything I write is a fragment of me. And, you know, what's really interesting is I'm spending – there's a wonderful play, which some of you have, have seen, I'm sure, called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead. It's by Tom Stoppard. Wonderful British playwright. And so the two least important, shittiest characters in Hamlet are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're completely secondary, and they're so irrelevant, in fact, that when they die off camera somewhere else, off stage, someone just comes in and says, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. And it's just announced with no sort of pomp or circumstance. And what Stopper did quite brilliantly in this play is he makes them the center of this play, 
and the rest of Hamlet takes place in the background as they're like bumbling around the stage. So, you know, when Hamlet says to be or not to be, he's like sighing like a drama queen in the background, but they're having a conversation in the foreground. And what's so wonderful about it is that everybody is the hero of their own story. Everybody's the center of their own story. And so I try to remember that for every character. And so it starts with my own fears and concerns or anxieties or vulnerabilities or hopes or dreams. But I try to imbue that in every character to imagine them from the inside out. And in a weird way, that's the process of what of what's happening when you're reading. You know, and it's part of why when people talk about gratuitous violence, I try to intimate violence more than show it incredibly graphically. Same with sex, same with emotional moments that land with us. It's better if I'm I'm sort of indicating it and letting you fill it with what your individual fears or hopes are. Um, and so that's a big part of writing. I'll tell you a quick story. I wrote a book called um... <laughs> You're Next. That's what the book was called. And there's two characters in it. That was great to have a moment of being like, I did write a book. I wrote a book once. And there's two characters. And one of the characters, a little guy who's very scrappy and mouthy, and there's a, there's a very big hulking guy, the kind of guy who I, I'd imagine you'd be uh, repulsed by him were he to take his shirt off. But he's a huge character. I'm never going to live that down, I, no, am no. I? No. Well, it was so funny because I was sitting there going, what interview am I in now? What's happening? <laughs> and I, I, I set as a goal for myself that in every scene he'd only say one word but it would be a really creepy word. So there's a scene where there's a home invasion and there's a couple tied up on the couch and he has a big duffel bag on his shoulder and the little guy's yammering and then it's time to start getting answers from them and he looks at the big guy and he says, where do you want to start? And the big guy whose name is Dodge dips his shoulder and the duffel bag just hits the floor with a clank of hard edge tools and he says, joints. And I end the chapter. I'm on book tour six months later, and this woman comes up to me and goes, I, I have to tell you, I really enjoyed the book. I couldn't believe the level of graphic and overt violence that you wrote in the book in that scene with the home invasion. And I thought, lady, that was all you. Because I, I ended that scene, and whatever she imagined, right, that's her fears and anxieties and phobias, whatever each one of you imagines is worse than if I spell it out. I'd rather leave it to you. And so it's really about creating the conditions for you as you recreate the book, because every book is a collaboration between me and an individual reader. Every time you read a book, it's a different book that you reconstitute. I want to leave that up to you as much, and so I try and find that in my characters and then, and then lay the groundwork not too overtly. Now, oh, Patrick, you have another one? I can also see certain authors who are, who are tuned into our broadcast, and I won't reveal who they one are. One of them, hi, Lee. <laughs> no, no. Well, maybe. Um, let's see here. Yeah, there were a couple of good ones here. Um, I'm going to merge these two together. I would like to ask Mr. Hurwitz if there are any differences between classic and modern thriller books, in his opinion. And then how do you keep the genre up to date? And then related to that is, what are the characteristics that make a thriller's uh, protagonist credible? which is a good question. That's so many. Well, I think the classic thrillers to my mind, and of course, you know, I'm sitting with a with an expert here, with two experts, the asker of the question and Barbara. I mean, my head would go to Forsyth and the Day of the Jackal and Follett and Le Carre, right? Um, this is my giveaway book tonight. I'm oh, going to Terry make a Hayes. moment. I have a damaged copy, I, and some lucky person is going to go home with this, which I think... We're going to give it to the most damaged person. We're, there's a. To try but to so I think, figure that out. I think that the conventional thrillers tended to be more international intrigue and spy, right? They, it was more Ian Fleming. It was, it was more in that grasp. And thrillers now have sort of branched out more psychologically. Uh, and, and there's different variations of it. One of the things that's actually a template for me, very interestingly, is a classic um, Private Eye series, which is the master himself, Robert B. Parker, um, Spencer. The Spencer for Hire series, what's so amazing about it is, as opposed to James M. Cain and Chandler and Hammett, is he, he, he took the P.I. and he put him in the real world. He cooks, he's got, you know, he has a very intimate relationship with a woman who's, you know, incredibly wise, has more, is more psychologically acute than he is. It really introduced a sort of depth and intimacy into that genre. And I think I realized some years in that I'm trying to do that 
I'm striving to do the same in thrillers of making a character who is living in the real world with us in a way that I hope feels updated in that regard. I mean, that's what I'm striving for. Um, and then in terms of technology, it's really about being way out ahead. I will tell you with this book, you know, I turned this book in probably a year and a half ago, um, you know, and then edits and, and, and other stuff happened. But I was really concerned that we were going to run out of that, that events were going to overtake us. Because as the world accelerates, and AI certainly is putting, a, machine learning is putting us on a hyperbolic curve, um, I was worried that, that the book would be defunct. And we, you know, we just got it out in time. I'm glad you're here. It's opening night. As of tomorrow, it's not going to be, it's going to be defunct. But, you know, so it's, it's very important to be thinking um, ahead if you're going to use technology to start to reach further and further ahead. And that process gets more rapid. I think back to The Kill Clause, my fourth book, um, 2004, I want to say, and I still remember the marketing department at William Morrow was shocked because I, I described how our cell phones have this stuff in them called GPS, that's global positioning satellites, and that you can track people's location based on our cell phones. And the whole marketing department was like freaked out about that. So you think about the things that we take for granted with the acceleration of technology. And if you're going to use technology, you know, it, it better be it better be something that's that's cutting edge or deployed in clever fashion. I don't like to just use research and technology. I don't write techno thrillers like Clancy, um, to some extent like Crichton. I always want to have the research deployed, you know, in service of of character um, in ways that it's not the focal point. I'm not going to spend three chapters describing how a submarine functions, you know. But uh, the creation of his fortress, uh, I think you would all agree, is so much fun. And it <laughs> must have been, it must have been fun coming up with that. And uh, are are there security companies that are kind of next level? Uh, yeah, I, I talk to hackers who are pretty staggering. Um, I just did a two and a half hour podcast with with one. Uh, his name's R Snake. You can look him up. I mean, really staggering. Um, international level hacker and I, I have a couple people on tap whose whose names I refer to I, I refer to a bit euphemistically um, yeah and I think you know one of the other the other questions you ask is how you how to keep them contemporary I think another key is to have people from all parts of society and so with Evan you know he's got Tommy Stojak but he's also got Jackie Mor uh, Joey Morales the, the characters are from kind of all walks of life so I don't feel like I'm ever tucking into one demographic or choosing a sort of ideological filter you know i never choose sides i might choose sides in the real world when it comes to the culture or politics but i don't choose sides in fiction and so the characters represent i hope a whole mosaic of viewpoints and there's something in that i think that 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 keeps it a little bit more flexible he's kind of a lone wolf with this ensemble cast this that's sort of right community. and that's the trick is to balance the lone wolf with the with the ensemble so I don't think that we can have a better answer than Greg has just given us. So um, I'm going to move to the part where first we thank him. This is publication day. So thank you all very much for coming yeah, to Greg's you. publication this is my party. Lunch party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. And Greg actually blurbed um, "I Am Pilgrim," which was an enormous bestseller ten years ago. Um, but the reason that I wanted to give this away tonight is that it, it's a it's an amazing update. In a way, it's an international thriller. It's got terrorists. You're in wonderful, scary places. There's a fabulous villain, the whole bit. But the part that I've enjoyed in many ways the most, and even Sean Connery has a sort of brief moment in this book, um, is that this is James Bond for today, but it's not James Bond, and it's not M. It's Q. This book has taken Q and the car and all the gadgets and whatever and taken them to a whole new level. And it's absolutely fabulous the way they keep reinventing this same guy as he's trying to cycle through. And, you know, all, all thrillers really basically are a chase between an antagon a protagonist and an antagonist. And the better the villain, the more exciting the book. He's a wonderful talent. Oh, Lord. And, and he's a movie guy. Um, and so you can see that in that he is obviously figured out, possibly in movies with all the special effects, how this one guy can move through the world in a constant changing um, persona. Even his fingerprints, you know, everything about him changes. It's amazing. So we do have um, 
a damaged copy. I don't. I forgot my my advanced reading copy, but I'm not going to give it away anyway. So, um, what are we, John? Are we at between one and twenty-one? Okay. So, would you pick a number between one and twenty-one, and we will give a copy of the Year of the Locust away. And you can watch the interview with him from last night on our um, YouTube or Facebook. It's, it's right up there. Am I picking the number? Yep. I'm going to pick one. You are. It's you. Well, wonderful. Half the time, one isn't here because they're home in their jammies watching this. No, no, no. I'll take your word for it. You are entirely welcome. So um, this is the moment when if you would pick up your chairs and move them against the wall and line up by number, Greg will be happy to sign your book and you can take photos and all that fun stuff. Thank you very much for coming and have a safe drive home. Thank you.